Well, thank you everyone for coming today. I want to start off by saying very clearly that just a few years ago, up until the year 2005, I myself used to believe that Muhammad was a prophet of Allah. I used to believe that the Quran was his final revelation, the whole compilation of everything that had come before, brought to its summit in the form of God's book revealed to Muhammad over 23 years. I used to believe that Muhammad was the exemplary man, and that following his every action, his every word, his every utterance, would produce in me a character that would be beyond all characters. And I used to believe that Jesus was just a prophet, yes, the Messiah, even going to come back to initiate the end of times, but not God, by any means, certainly not God. These were the things I used to believe. And I found out over time that in order to really be able to believe truly in my heart what I think is the truth, I need to be able to defend it for myself. I need to not just take what people tell me, but rather investigate, understand what is the grounding of these facts, these beliefs in truth. Are they honestly true? Or am I just taking them at face value because people I've respected my whole life have told me they're true? And that was the case. My parents told me to believe in Islam. The Imams had told me to believe in Islam. I had so many people who I respected telling me what to believe. And so I listened to them. And at a certain point, I realized I, I need to look into these things for myself. And I had been challenged to do so as well. But I was so convinced that Islam is true that I knew right off the bat, no matter what historical investigation I undertook, it would lead me to confirm the things that I had been taught about Muhammad, about Jesus, about the Quran, about everything that Islam taught me. And I figured just looking into these things will confirm what I already believe. Today we're going to be talking specifically about Jesus. And Jesus was actually the turning point when I investigated the life of Jesus as told by the Quran versus the Christian uh, theology, and I compared it to history, that was the turning point in my understanding of the truth. First of all, I knew, I just knew, when I started this investigation, I knew that the Quran would be confirmed by history. I knew that according to the Quran, chapter 4, verse 157, He was not killed, Jesus Christ was not killed, nor was he crucified. But so it appeared to them. So this is saying in the Quran, Jesus was not killed on the cross, nor was he crucified, but so it was made to appear to them. The Quran makes it very clear Jesus did not die on the cross. And so as a, as a Muslim, I had thought surely an investigation of history would confirm this. The Quran also says that Jesus certainly wasn't God. Chapter 5, verse 116 and 117. And behold, God will say, talking about in the future, at the end of times, God will say, O oh Jesus, the son of Mary, did you say to men, worship me, as in worship Jesus, and my mother, as gods, in addition to Allah? He will say, glory be to you. Never could I say what I had no right to say. Never did I say to them anything except what you told me to say. Worship God, my Lord and your Lord. So the Qur'an makes it clear, Jesus never claimed to be God. He never told anyone to worship him. This is something that must have happened later because while he was with them, they didn't say anything of the sort. And I knew, again, as a Muslim when I was investigating history, that this would probably be confirmed. Finally, the third thing that the Qur'an told me, um, but with which, with, with which Christians were in general agreement, was that Jesus did miracles. The Qur'an, chapter 3, verse 49 says, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, in that I make for you out of clay, as it were, the figure of a bird, and breathe into it, and it becomes a living bird by God's leave. And I heal those that are born blind, and the lepers, and I bring to the dead to life by God's leave. So here in this statement, chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 49, Jesus is giving life to birds. He's cleansing the lepers. He's giving sight to the blind. He's even raising the dead. Jesus is clearly miraculous in the Quran. And I figured an historical investigation would confirm this as well. <clears throat> and knowing these things, I had the Christian belief, on the other hand, to which I was going to compare my historical investigation. For one, Christianity taught that Jesus died on the cross. All five Gospels, clear, I'm sorry, all four Gospels and Q, if you believe in Q theory, all five sources clearly say that Jesus died on the cross. There's, there's no equivocation in this matter. They make it extremely clear Jesus died on the cross. They also extremely clearly state that Jesus claimed to be God, that Jesus received worship, that he was in fact entitled to all things God was entitled to. The Gospels make this extremely clear. So the question for me was simple. How do I find out what's the truth? We have these two conflicting worldviews. How do I find out what's the truth? The answer is simple. 
When you're investigating something from a historical perspective, what are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to go to books written hundreds and hundreds of years later to see what a man was like? Absolutely not. You go to the books that are written right around that person's life. For example, if I want to read about Abraham Lincoln, I could read books about him now, or I could read the primary sources that were written right around his life. Which one of those two is more likely to be accurate? The one written right by his lifetime. It's not leaving out any details that we might have wanted to add over time. So when we turn to the life of Jesus, what do I want to study? Books written hundreds of years later, hundreds of miles later in different social contexts? Or do we want to read the books that are written first and foremost about him, the very first ones, and what they say? <clears throat> well, I did some brief historical investigation. I found out that the books that were written most close to Jesus' life about him are in fact the four Gospels of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of them were written no later than 70 years after Jesus' death. In fact, parts of the Gospel of Mark are thought to have been written within a decade after Jesus' death. The entire Gospel of Mark, no more than 30 years after Jesus' death. Some people would extend that to, to 70 years. Uh, I'm sorry, to 40 years. But even 40 years. This is still the earliest book that we have. When it comes to great historical figures like Alexander the Great, the first books that we have are more than three centuries after his death. And so when we compare the life of Jesus to the Gospels that we have and the amount of time that transpired between them, it really is minimal. And we can thus trust the New Testament to at least be historically accurate to a high degree. Now, if there are things that conflict in the New Testament, remember, I'm thinking as a Muslim still at this point. If there are things that conflict in the Gospels of the New Testament, then we can throw certain sections out. We can say, okay, these conflict, we'll leave it out. This does not conflict, we should assume it's true. But if there are some things that are said over and over and over again in all the Gospels and never contradicted, then those are most likely to be accurate. This was the mindset with which I started my investigation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> The very first issue I decided to investigate was one that seemed less emotionally charged. Did Jesus die on the cross or not? Is this something that happened in history? Well, of course. He either died or he didn't. This isn't a matter of philosophy, so we can investigate it. As it turned out, when I was looking at the sources and what they said, without exception, all the sources around Jesus' life make it abundantly clear that Jesus did die on the cross. Jewish sources, such as Josephus, Mara Bar Serapion, and Talmud, people who are writing about Jesus from a Jewish perspective, they all agree Jesus died on the cross. Gentile sources, such as Tacitus and Lucian of Samosata, they agree that Jesus died on the cross. First generation Christians, such as Papias, I'm sorry, such as Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, the author of the book of Hebrews, all of them agree that Jesus died on the cross. And second generation Christians, such as Papias, Clement of Rome, Polycarp, Ignatius, all of them agree that Jesus died on the cross. All these people wrote down the fact that Jesus died on the cross, and there was no one who even ventured to write any conception of the idea that he did not die on the cross. There's nothing to the contrary. If you want to go even earlier than that, we can. New Testament scholars have determined that there are certain creeds within the New Testament that are traced back to even before the authors who recorded them. Yes, they were recorded by certain authors, but they were written before that. For example, in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 6 through 11, the Carmen Christi. This is known to be a hymn that early Christians sang to Jesus and that Paul simply recorded. He did not invent. What does this say? This says that he died on the cross as well. Other creeds also. 1 Corinthians 15 says the same thing. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 has been investigated by atheists and agnostics ad nauseum. I mean, they have really studied this thing. And one atheist who's very much against Christianity, his name is Marcus Borg, he has said that the creed in 1 Corinthians 15 that says Jesus died on the cross was made within months of Jesus' death. You can have nothing faster in history. You can have nothing closer to the event. Jesus killed uh, in early part of the year, and by the end of the year, people are already writing down the fact that he died on the cross. There is nothing that can have this stronger. This is why scholars today say the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is among the most incontrovertible facts of history. Gert Ludemann, an athe atheist New Testament scholar, says Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. John Dominic Crossan, again, no friend of Christianity, but a well-known scholar, says there is not the slightest doubt about the fact of Jesus' crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. Crossan also said that, that he was crucified is as sure as anything can ever be. Paula Fredrickson, another scholar, says the single most solid fact about Jesus' life is his death. He was executed by the Roman prefect Pilate on or around Passover. 
Finally, no, no conversation would be complete here without Bart Ehrman, who says, one of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on the orders of the Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. These scholars are saying it is so abundantly clear. All the sources are in agreement that Jesus died on the cross. There's no reason to think otherwise. This is one of the most powerful facts of history. That is what they're saying. There is no argument to the contrary. In order to say that Jesus did not die on the cross, we have to take it sheerly off of faith without any reasoning whatsoever. And that is not what we find in a historical investigation. Well, what about the argument that Jesus claimed to be God? This is also of extreme importance. Did he claim to be God or not? If he didn't, then Christianity falls. You can't have uh, salvation from a man's blood. You have to have salvation from someone who holds an infinite account, able to sacrifice for our sins, and that would be God alone. Did Jesus claim to be God? Well, when we look at the earliest source that we have about Jesus' life, the earliest biographical source, let's call it the book of Mark, we can see that Jesus clearly claimed to be God. Now, I would love to go into all the details here, but how much time do I have left? We have uh, ten. ten. Ten minutes left. Well, good. Um, I'll get as much detail as I can. Now, Jesus referred to himself in one title for the most part. This title that he used is a title that no one else really referred to him with. Pretty much Jesus' favorite title for himself was the Son of Man. Now, what is this title, the Son of Man? Does it mean that Jesus just claims to be a regular man? Well, let's see how he uses it. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41, The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks. Whoa, this Son of Man has angels at his disposal, and he has his own kingdom? Let's keep reading, Matthew chapter 24. For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wow, when this person comes... Lightning is going to flash from the sky, or at least that's how it's going to seem. That's how powerful and majestic this Son of Man is. It doesn't just sound like a weak human. Let's look some more. Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. In His kingdom, remember Matthew says that He has a kingdom and He has His own angels. Now He has His own throne full of glory. We read on about the Son of Man. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? Luke 18. Luke 21. But keep alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape these things that are about to take place and strength to stand before the Son of Man. Whoa, you need to have strength to stand before the Son of Man. There's something so majestic about him that it strikes fear into hearts of people and they need to have strength. They need to pray to have strength to stand before the Son of Man. Well, this title, Son of Man, then, doesn't seem like just a regular person. Maybe in certain circumstances it does, but at least here it doesn't, clearly, when Jesus is using it in at least these five circumstances. What is this Son of Man? Well, Jesus is very clearly alluding to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. In this section of the Old Testament, Daniel, a prophet, is looking in the night sky. This is in the Old Testament now. And Daniel's looking at the Father, the Ancient of Days, sitting on a throne, being worshipped by angels. And then, as he's looking at God, the Father... He says, I kept looking in my night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him, the son of man, was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. This son of man who approaches God the Father is given a dominion. He's given a kingdom. He's given glory. People of every nation and language will serve him. And by the way, that word serve is the Hebrew word latruo, the Greek word pelach, which is a service due only to God. The 130 times it's used in the Bible, that service is only ever given to God with one exception. And in that one exception, God cursed the people because they gave it to someone other than God. That service is always due to God. Yet here, in Daniel chapter 7, it's being given to one who looks like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. People serve him in a service due only to God. This man has his own kingdom. He has glory. He's being worshipped, ladies and gentlemen. And this Son of Man, coming on the clouds of heaven, is exactly what Jesus calls himself. Mark chapter 14, verse 62 He's responding to the chief priest, Caiaphas of the Sanhedrin. Caiaphas has just asked him, Who are you? Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus responds, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. He quotes from Daniel 7.13. 
this man who receives worship by all nations, men of every tongue, he says, I am that Son of Man who will come with the clouds of heaven. This passage is rife with divine intonation. We can actually see that the image of someone coming on the clouds of heaven is an image that's reserved for divine figures alone. Yet Jesus claims it for himself. In the same passage, he refers to the divine statement, Ego a me, I am. This I am statement is something that Jesus says over and over again in very powerful ways. John chapter 8, verse 24. When, uh, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Whoa, wait a minute. Unless I believe that you are, unless I am, what is that about? And why will I die in my sins unless I believe something about you? That makes no sense. You're just a man, right? Clearly, he's intonating something greater. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. What is he saying? Well, he makes it very clear just a few, chapter, a few verses later. John 8, verse 58. The Jews have just said to him, You are not yet even 50 years old, yet you claim to have seen Abraham. They're saying, you're not even 50. How do you say you've seen Abraham? Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was born, I am. Wow. Jesus claims to exist eternally even before Abraham. And these are the exact same words he chooses to respond to chief, the chief priest with. I am. And you will see the Son of Man coming to the clouds of heaven. It's powerful. It's powerful. Now, I just have a few minutes left, and I want to address how I responded, ultimately, when I saw this, when I was still a Muslim, and I see this information. I realized, wait a minute, this information is extremely contrary to what I was taught in the Qur'an. The Qur'an said, He was not killed, nor was he crucified. But everyone else who's not Muslim says that this is one of the most powerful facts of history, that he was crucified. Why should I believe what the Qur'an says? The only way I could convince myself to believe what the Qur'an says about the death of Muhammad is if I first said, Islam is true then I will believe the Qur'an. I had to be circular. There was no good historical reason for me to believe that Jesus did not die on the cross. And what about the deity of Christ? I've just referred to a few sections from the, verse, from the gospel, of Math, uh, gospel of Mark. There is so much more. I just don't have time to cover it right now. But over and over and over again, from the earliest gospel to the last gospel, from things written outside of the gospels, from things written outside of the Bible, we see people over and over again ascribing to Jesus deity, Whereas the Qur'an said he never claimed to be God. He says, no God, I never told them to worship me. The problem is that the Qur'an was written 600 years after Jesus in a land 600 miles away from Jesus. Muhammad, unless we assume that he is true and he is a prophet, unless we assume that, we have to ask the question, where did he get this information about Jesus? And we find out that the information that he has is from various sources he even has information from false apocryphal gospels. For example, chapter 3 of the Qur'an, verse 37, verse 44, are taken from the Proto-Evangelium of James. This is a false gospel written under the name of James 150 years A.D. Chapter 19, verse 23 of the Qur'an is taken from the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew. This is a book that was written probably five to six centuries after the death of Christ. And yet... This is taken and included in the Qur'an. Chapter 19 of the Qur'an, verse 29 through 31, as well as chapter 3, verse 46, is taken from the Arabic infancy gospel of Thomas. It's an interesting account. As soon as Jesus is born, he starts talking and proclaiming Allah to the people, the moment he is born. Why would Muhammad say this about Jesus? Well, because it's found in the Arabic infancy gospel, a book that is a late forgery. Chapter 3, verse 49 of the Qur'an, chapter 5, verse 110. This is the verse I referred to you uh, when it says that Jesus breathed life into clay birds. Why would Muhammad say this? That Jesus had the ability to give life to clay and to turn him into birds? Why would Muhammad say this? It's a, it's a strange thing to make up. He didn't make it up. He found it in a forgery in the infancy gospel of Thomas, a book written 170 years A.D. So we find that the Qur'an tries to gather things that are written in its area, in its time frame, to tell us about Jesus. But I'm not going to refer to something written 600 years later than Jesus, 600 miles away from Jesus, when I can turn to something that's written very close to his time, the Gospel of Mark, written no more than 30 to 40 years later, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John, the writings of Peter, the writings of Paul, the writing of the author of the Hebrews. Why would I go further away than what's clearly stated? And what do they say? Well, they ascribe things to Jesus that are powerful. They say things like he is the creator, that he is the savior, that he raised the dead, that he is the judge, that he is the light, that he is the glory of God, that he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the redeemer, the bridegroom, the forgiver of sins. He's worshiped by angels, addressed in prayer. He's the creator of angels, and he's confessed as Lord. This is what we find out about Jesus from the earliest 
testaments that we have about him. And I will choose to believe what they say over anything that came later. That is what we can know about Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kureshi. That was uh, very nice of you. Um, the topic, who is Jesus? We heard uh, the Christian side that who is Jesus. And uh, as I mentioned in the beginning about the uh, Muslim faith, a Muslim I mean the believer who believes in the last prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Before we go to the, in some uh, details, I would like to make a statement about how God created human and further guidance, the prophet. I mentioned very few uh, words in the opening ceremony. As I mentioned, the prophets, they are humans. Like us, they, you know, born, raised, get older, and die. Like an ordinary man. And this is uh, from thousands and thousands and thousands of years. It's nothing new. The first prophet, as we know, the prophet Adam, who is the father of the nation, he was also human. And till today, whoever is born, they are human. Now, when we look at the objective of this human in this world, what is his objective? Why is he created? You know, this is a question. And most people don't know why. You know, why this mic? Someone, why someone made this mic? There's a reason for it. Because if someone has a low voice like me, everyone can hear them. What is the objective of this light? So, if it's dark, it can be uh, light. So, same thing. The human also has objective of his life. A human has objective. God, as we know, the Lord who created this universe. This is my faith, you know. We, there is a God who created this whole universe. The sun, the moon, the earth, all the planets, etc. It's a huge system out there. It's not time to go through it. There is someone who created it. It was not just, you know, made up from nothing. Now, when God created that whole system and it is serving. You know, there are, as mentioned in the Quran, fi falakin yasbahun, it is a system of this whole universe. So definitely this human also must be having some objective, right? It's not he just came in the world to, you know, enjoy his life, that's it. Now, suppose this, this mic, this microphone, this doesn't work. What, what happens to it? Try to fix it, right? And, but since these days everything is disposable, you know, China makes so many things, you know, we just throw it and buy one, it's cheaper. To buy a new one, then repair it. It's gonna cost you $100 to repair it, and the new one is gonna cost only $20. But, however, we try to fix something was messed up. You have a car, it gets messed up, we try to fix it. So this is the same case of the human. The human, God created him for a reason. The reason was his worship, to worship him, and he was created to be tested because the eternity where a human is supposed to be is the heaven <coughs> where he's gonna enjoy his life forever. So this world is just a temporary place for a human where he's going to be lived. Now, as I mentioned, the devil, the shaitan, he does not want him to earn that, you know, place in heaven and there's hell you know God created these two uh, uh, places the heaven and hell whoever is righteous and believes in God and falls upon his uh, message 
his instructions, he will be sent to heaven. And if not, if he's being, uh, if he follows the devil, the shaitan, he will be in hell. Now, when we have the heaven and hell, God wants the human to be in heaven. And the devil wants him to be in hell because the devil is going to be in hell. There's no way he's going to be in the heaven because he disobeyed God. He did not bow when he was ordered. So he made an oath that he's going to take each and every human with him in the hell. Now God, his mercy, he sent messengers to explain that why are you here? What is the objective of life? Every prophet had a single message. Now, when it comes to Jesus, Isa, as in Arabic language, like Suleiman, Salman, Dawood, David, Moses, Musa, Muhammad, that's the only word that's being used for Muhammad. So, Jesus, in that same aspect, like Prophet Adam, David, Moses, they were prophets of Allah, of God. Isa, Jesus, was a prophet. And he was born without a father. That's a miracle. That's the miracle. He was born without a father. This is against, you know, the scientific way of a human. A human has to have parents, right? Father and mother. Without a father, it's not possible for a woman to be pregnant. But Jesus was born without a father. And when he was a baby, infant, few months old, when it's impossible for someone to talk, he spoke. As the Quran mentions, قَالَ إِنِّي عَبْدُ اللَّهِ I am a servant of God, of Allah. Atani al Kitab, he gave me a book. Wajalani Nabiya made me a prophet. That's also a miracle. Second miracle. First miracle was he was born without a father. Second miracle, he spoke when he was infinite, a baby. Third, as Dr. Qureshi mentioned, even the Quran mentions that he gave life to a clay bird, put life in it, put a soul in it, and it started flying. A bird made out of clay, it starts flying. In those days, there was no signs of robots, you know, flying around. It was a real bird. He used to give life to death. A person, he died. He gave life to him, he stood up and started walking, etc. These are the miracles of Prophet Jesus. Peace be upon him. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, a Muslim, a believer in the last messenger, Muhammad, believes that Jesus is not son of God. Neither is God, but he is a regular human messenger of God. Now, these uh, extraordinary you know, uh, powers that he had, it does not show that he was God. Because God wanted to be a miracle. And I'll mention later on also. The uh, prophet uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, he was a prophet to his people. And he will be back in the end of the days. We don't know when is that happening. That's our belief. That Jesus was not killed, he was not crucified, but he was lifted up to the heavens and he, he was protected from the evil of the uh, people that tried to kill him. And in, uh, whenever it is God willing, he will come back down and he will rule the world. That's the Islam, this is what the Quran teaches us. That he didn't die and he will be back and he will rule the world. Part of the religion of Islam, but he will be the ruler. 
And uh, there's a long story also about that. So Prophet uh, Jesus, as I mentioned clear now, you know, like our doctor, before I, I go into a little bit detail, I would like to make this very clear. I'm not going to have any debate over there. It's just a discussion. I don't want no arguments. It's just, you know, uh, we, like I mentioned at the beginning, we should uh, try to figure out what is the truth. Whatever. I don't say what I am saying, that's exactly the truth. Whatever is the truth, we should ask Lord, you know, God, to, you know, tell us what is the truth. And we try to follow upon it. Being a God, gods have, you know, tremendous powers. And God, as a Muslim, his belief is God, he is superior. And he does not have any habits of the creation. You know, more like a human. Human is part of a, the creation, right? It's not only humans. There are animals, the bees, the, you know, this whole galaxy, etc. So, uh, God, his powers are really beyond the creation. So we have to, you know, define who is God? What are his uh, jurisdictions? What are his powers? Now, Prophet Jesus, if you say he was God, why he was born? God is not born. He's, he's there from ever. Like how we say the one God, Allah, he is there from eternity. And he will be for eternity. And everyone besides God, Allah, is a creation. He created, God created him. It was nothing. God created this whole universe and the human. So even prophets, they were created. But a prophet in the Islamic aspect, a prophet is not an ordinary man. He does not ever, neither in his childhood, neither when he's adult, ever do anything wrong against God's will. That's why he's superior. He's above all mankind and that's why God they select you know the prophets are chosen from God to be an example for the mankind and every prophet had their own you know specialities their own you know uh, as the time like prophet Noah he he lived nine and a half nine hundred and fifty years as the Quran tells us he Convey the message for 950 years. Prophet Moses came, and the tribulation he went through, and his tribe. When it came down to Prophet uh, Jesus, he was, according to Islamic studies, he lived only 33 years of his life, and uh, he was the youngest prophet, as the Quran teaches us. Now, Jesus was sent to the, the Jew, the Bani Israel, the Jewish community who were, you know, off the path of the Torah. Now, when he, Jesus came, of course, you know, Musa after he died, and there were a lot of times, you know, prophets came, there are thousands and thousands of prophets came to the Jewish community. But what they did, they changed their book. And they, you know, put their own instructions according to their own desire, according to their own wills. Prophet Jesus came to correct that. And as prophets, some of them, they were given books. The first was given to Prophet Abraham. The first prophet who was given a book, after that was given to Moses, the, the Torah, then Prophet David, Prophet Jesus, then Prophet Muhammad. So now a prophet, when he comes, he comes to correct whatever corruption is in there in the environment. You know, every mayor, every president of the country comes and he, this is agenda, right? Okay, this is what is going on in the country. We have to fix this up. So he gives his agenda and whatever, uh, you know, uh, he thinks is best for the nation. So a prophet, that's why he comes to correct 
whatever is being misleaded, misguided. So the Prophet Jesus, he came to correct whatever was misguided in the Jewish community. After that, when he came and he, gave, he invited them and he was given the Bible, which is called Injil, Injil, and it's very uh, interesting point also, if you look in the Bible, you won't find the book called Bible. Is not mentioned Bible in any in any you know verse version of the Bible that this book is called the Bible, but if you look on the other hand, Quran, thousands of times mentioned different names. So the Bible was revealed to correct the Jewish family. Now, now when it was against their willing, against their desire, they started making plots against him, and they decided to kill him. And they made a huge plot where, you know, of course, God always helps his prophets. Now, when they plotted to hang him, God sent two angels, picked him up to the heaven. That's the Islamic view. And he was saved from all of that uh, plot that they made. As the Dr. Nabil he pointed out the verse of the Quran, <coughs> they were misleaded. They thought maybe they killed him, but he was not killed. That's number one. Number two, if we look at the different uh, versions of the Bible. Number one, the Bible, the original Bible which was given to the Prophet the Injil, which is given to the Prophet uh, Jesus, was in Hebrew, not in any other language. And it was translated. <coughs> now when you translate one language to another, sometimes people put their own thoughts, and every translator has his own opinion. That's how Bible start getting mixed up, changing around. If we look at the other side, the Quran, which I will say it is the truth because 1400 years and a half the Quran was revealed in Arabic language till today it is in the same language in the same format no book in this whole universe existed that long no one in the world can claim that Quran it was slightly one letter was changed I Learn, memorize the whole Quran, 30 chapters, 140 surahs. And this chain is gone. <coughs> I learned from my teacher, my teacher, all the way down, 1400 years. So the Quran is in that same, you know, format which was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. And Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad, did not come in, you know, uh, disgrace or, you know, uh, disagree that. Oh, we don't believe in Jesus? The Quran teaches us that until you do not believe in all prophets, you're not a believer. You cannot enter heaven if you do not believe in the prophets. So the summary is Jesus, Isa, salam, peace be upon him, was a messenger of Allah, not God, not the son of God. He was a miracle of God sent to this world. And Jesus, son of Mary, Maria, it was something extraordinary. Number two, the powers which he had. Quran mentions that he had these powers. It was given by God. And the Quran is mentions very clearly the same verse with Dr. Nabil also mentioned. Be'idni, the word says, be'idni means by my permission. He used to give life to the dead with God's permission. So it means the power that he had, it was not his own powers. It was from God, the Lord, the Allah, the only Almighty, one God. So this thing also we have to you know, look through it that, you know, the powers he had, okay, that's true. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no debate on that. But he got, earned those powers from God, from Allah, from the only one God. Number two, like how we mentioned, God was from ever and will 
be forever. Prophet Jesus was born, okay? He came in a time, for a time period. Then his time was up, he left. Like how any other prophet, he came for a time period. Prophet Adam, Noah, Moses, David, Solomon, they all prophets, they came for a time period and they conveyed their message and they were called back. Prophet Muhammad, the last prophet, he came for a time period and he, his time was over, went back. So no prophet, even the prophet Muhammad, he was not God. He was just a uh, man who was giving this responsibility to you know, lead the humanity to the straight path. So in the end, my time is finished. Uh, it is a very long topic and this topic is going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's just uh, a matter of guidance from God. Thank you so much.